Saint Iluned of Brecon and Her Cult by John A. F. Thompson First published in Studies in Church History, Volume 30, Martyrs and Martyrologies, 1993 The cult of Saint Iluned is much more fully documented than the saint herself, being described in two sources of the 12th and 15th centuries. These must therefore be the starting point for an investigation both into the saint's historicity, which is at best dubious, and into the significance of the cult, which throws light on religious practices over a very lengthy period. Aspects of these practices and comparisons with other cults elsewhere may well point to an early origin for this one. As it is preferable to work from more secure evidence through the sketchier sources to more hypothetical ideas, the two sources with which we must start are the Itinerarium Cambrii of Gerald of Wales, written about 1190, in which he gives an elaborate description of a hilltop festival near Brecon, and the Itineraries of William Worcester of 1478, which show that the cult still persisted there, although possibly in a less elaborate form. These accounts may be supplemented by some additional information on folk practices in the manuscript of Hugh Thomas from the early 18th century. Although this derives largely from Gerald, it may add some additional information about the cult. Gerald and Wooster both describe the saint by the name Elevatha. Thomas calls her Saint Lud and suggests that Gerald had called her Almeida. Obviously, the V in Elevatha could be read as N, and the M in Almeida as N. The name of Iluned must have been preserved locally, because on a map of Breconshire a site is designated as St. Ellen's Chapel. Gerald's account refers to the 24 daughters of Brechin, from whom the land derived its name, Brechinyok, and states that with them all living their lives in an odor of sanctity. Many churches throughout Wales bore their names. One of these is in the province of Brechignac, not far from the chief castle of Aberhothany, situated on the peak of a certain hill, and is called the Church of St. Elevatha. For this is the name of the Holy Virgin, who, scorning marriage with an earthly king, triumphed in wedding the eternal king in blessed martyrdom. Now her solemn feast is celebrated in the same place each year on the first day of August, where on that day many of the people assemble from distant parts and those who are sick with various diseases are accustomed to receive the health they desire through the merits of the Holy Virgin. It is worth my while saying what normally happens at almost every feast of this Virgin here. You would see men and girls, sometimes in the church, sometimes in the cemetery, and sometimes in a dance which takes its course around the cemetery with singing, suddenly fall to the ground, at first quiet as if fallen into a trance, and then immediately leaping up as if seized by a frenzy, miming publicly with hands and feet those tasks which they normally did unlawfully on feast days. You would see one man setting his hand to the plow, another rousing oxen as with a goad, and both, as if to ease their toil, lifting up their voices in their usual kind of barbarous songs. You would see one imitating the art of the cobbler, another that of the skinner. You would see one woman pretending to carry a distaff, drawing out the thread to its length with her hands and arms, and then combing the drawn-out thread as if coiling it on a spindle, and another walking to and fro with the threads as if laying out a web. You would be amazed at a third sitting weaving as if the web were already set up, casting her shuttle back and forth, and alternately striking the cloth at close quarters with her reed. Finally, you would be astonished at them being brought into church with their offerings to the altar, as if they had been awakened and returning home. This account gives the impression of some barely Christianized cult, intended to bring prosperity to the community in both its agricultural and its craft works. The mention of tasks which they normally did unlawfully on feast days may, however, suggest that the ritual also had some kind of expiatory role and was perhaps even an attempt to obtain healing for injuries sustained for such unlawful works. Although Gerald makes no reference to such cures taking place, this would parallel some of the healings recorded in the Miracula of Gregory of Tours. The practices followed, however, give more of an impression of folk customs than of recognized ecclesiastical rites. 
William Worcester does not allude to this collective cult, but describes a more individual form of recourse to the alleged site of the saint's martyrdom. Saint Elevatha, Virgin and Martyr, one of the 24 daughters of the petty king of Brecknock in Wales, 24 miles from Hereford. She lies in the church of the Virgin nuns of the town of Usk and was martyred on a hill one mile from Brecon where a spring of water welled forth, and the stone on which she was beheaded remains there. And as often as someone in honor of God and the said saint shall say the Lord's prayer or drink of the water of the spring, he shall find a hair of the said holy woman upon the stone. A great miracle. This account shows the persistence of the legends of the saint, which, indeed, were still preserved in popular traditions at an even later date. Hugh Thomas probably compiled his account in the first decade of the 18th century, he states in his record of the legends of St. Kynock that he had visited the site in 1702. Both there and in his description of the sufferings and martyrdom of St. Ludd, he claimed to draw on popular traditions of the poor ignorant country people or of the innocent country people, as well as from earlier sources. He inserts into the passage from Gerald's itinerarium the story of her flight in disguise to avoid marriage to a young prince, her ill-treatment by the inhabitants of various villages, whom she subsequently cursed, and who suffered unpleasant fates as a result, her establishment in a hermitage by the lord of the manor, and her ultimate martyrdom, when her frustrated lover discovered her, pursued her, and struck off her head. When the head came to rest, a spring of water welled forth, and a chapel was later built on the site of her hermitage. This chapel survived until the time of the Reformation. The writer claimed to have heard this account of the saint's sufferings from the present lord of the land, who also told about continuing popular devotion to the site. To this place the young people of the town did use to come every May Day and have many sports and diversions from an abuse of the devout custom of visiting the church in former times but this is now quite laid aside. These passages pose questions for the historian, both about the background of the saint and about the nature of her cult. Other references to her by name are few, brief, and problematical. She is mentioned in the two so-called Brechen texts, the De Situ Brechenyak, in the London, British Library, Manuscript Cotton Vespasian A.14, and the Cognatio Brechen in Cotton Domitian I. The references are very brief, in a list of the 24 daughters of Brechen. The Vespasian manuscript dates from about 1200, roughly contemporary with Gerald, but may originate in the collection at Gloucester, around 1130 or later, of hagiographical material from Lanbadarn IV in West Wales, and possibly from Landaf. The De Situ Brechenyak was probably copied from an earlier manuscript, at least as old as the 11th century, and the reference reads, Ileveth, Philia Brachon, Igruk Gors a nail, with a Latin gloss above, I, in Agira Lacus Calcionis. The Cognatio Brechen manuscript is much later, dating from the 16th century, but probably derives from one of the 13th. It reads, Ilivet in Monte Gorsuil, K pro amore castitatis martyrizata est, there is clearly a parallelism between the Welsh text in the De Situ Brechenyak and the Latin of the Cognatio. Igruk is evidently in Krug, meaning on the hill, and it is easy to see possible paleographical confusion between Gorza Nail and Gorsawil. The Latin gloss in the De Situ is far from clear, and Wade Evans's translation of it as the Mound of the Holdings Mere is at best conjectural and is certainly far from illuminating as Calcionis has no discernible meaning, unless it is the genitive of either a personal or a place name. It may be wiser to disregard the gloss as a late addition which may be misleading. Wade Evans suggests that the Vespasian manuscript was copied by someone who did not understand Welsh, and that the gloss may therefore misrepresent the original meaning. A more plausible interpretation of the readings in this case would be to take Gors a nail Gorsawil, as meaning Gorsaf Hall, the station of the sun or solstice, thereby connecting the site and the saint with some traditional solar cult. Before examining the practices recorded by Gerald, 
it is necessary to note one further piece of 12th century evidence. Bishop Bernard of St. David's, 1116 to 49, granted the chapel of St. Halid to the prior and convent of Brecon, and his successor confirmed the grant. This probably is a reference to the same saint and suggests that her cult went back at least half a century before Gerald's account, perhaps contemporary with the collection of material later incorporated in the Vespasian manuscript. It is, however, at this point that a great gap emerges between the earliest records and the alleged date of the saint. If one follows the Brecon documents, one sees that they not only contain the genealogy of the eponymous chieftain from whom Brekiniog was allegedly named, but also assign him a 5th century Irish origin. The natural reaction to the Brecon documents is to dismiss them with total skepticism, but one fact must give one pause, namely, that archaeological evidence supports Irish connections with Brekiniog, Brecknock has a higher proportion of Ogham inscribed early Christian stones than any other Welsh shire except Pembroke. The frequency of stones with Irish characteristics in the latter shire is hardly surprising geographically, but their occurrence in Brecknock is. Although none of the stones of the earliest type occurs in the immediate vicinity of Breckentown and the center of the Iluned cult, it is not unreasonable to assume that the higher proportion of early Christian stones in this shire than in neighboring Glamorgan and Monmouth reflects the prominence of this area in early Christian Wales. This may indicate some substratum of truth behind the alleged Irish origin of Brecon. A further noteworthy characteristic of these early Welsh stones is the stress laid on filiation in the inscriptions, because although this was natural in Celtic tribal society, it was uncharacteristic of contemporary Christianity. It possibly reflects a fusion of the social values of Celtic tradition with the new religion. It is not only the stones which suggests that the early Brecknock Christianity absorbed some customary pagan traditions because aspects of the cult also hint at the adaptation of pagan customs to a Christian milieu. Gerald's description of rituals depicting the routines of plowing, spinning, and weaving may point to some form of sympathetic magic, and it is also noteworthy that August 1st, or Lammas, the date of the saint's festival, and May 1st, the date mentioned by Hugh Thomas as that on which the young people of Brecon visited the site, were two of the calendar feasts of the Celtic year. The coincidence may point to some pre-Christian cult which was taken over by the church. If the references in the Brecon texts to Gors and Nail Gorsawil do refer, as suggested, to a possible solar cult, this too would indicate a possible attempt to Christianize some earlier practice, although not one associated with the major feasts of Celtic tradition. A similar pagan background may be reflected in the stories of the saint's martyrdom. Gerald does not mention this, but the story recorded by Worcester and elaborated in the folk traditions noted by Thomas states that she died by beheading and that a spring of water gushed forth at the point where the saint's head came to rest. A parallel case to this from North Wales is that of St. Winifred in Flintshire, who was also beheaded while trying to escape a frustrated lover and at the place of whose decapitation a spring gushed out. This spring, rather than any collection of corporal relics, remained the center of Winifred's cult. A variant story is told of St. Kynock, Iluned's brother. When he was martyred by beheading, his head dropped into a well, which then dried up. These stories have obvious common origins, the importance of springs and rivers as focal points of ritual in pagan Celtic religion, and the cult of the severed head which was frequently connected with venerated waters. Welsh and Irish literature contain allusions to severed heads possessing magical qualities, and the head and neck of a woman have been found behind the wicker lining of a well on a British site in Buckinghamshire. In a well at Kerwent, an image of a mother goddess has been preserved, and in a pagan shrine from the same area, probably contemporary with the late Roman period, a head image has been found. Although nothing visible remains of St. Iluned's chapel itself on Slup Hill, there is a well there, with a megalith nearby, 
which may possibly have been the stone mentioned by Worcester. The combination of these factors may well mark out the site of the later chapel as a pre-Christian cult center. If the site and the cult observed there reflect a Christianizing of an existing holy place, an early date for its origins appears probable. It was a matter for debate in Dark Age Christianity how such pagan sites should be approached, and a story told by Gregory of Tours provides a possible Merovingian parallel to the development of the Iluned cult. A newly appointed bishop came to a place where the local rural population were accustomed to make offerings in a lake and built a church of St. Hilary on the shore of the marsh, telling his people not to stain their souls with vain rites, but rather to adore the relics of the saint there, as he could act as their intercessor with God. There was no religion, he said, in a swamp. The establishment of a Christian cult on an earlier pagan site sounds very similar to what probably happened in Wales. At a later date, Gregory the Great gave similar advice to Melitus for transmission to Augustine of Canterbury, laying down that pagan temples should be converted to Christian use, and that Christian solemnities should be kept in place of pagan sacrifices. The rituals recorded by Gerald may contain elements of such an adapted cult. Not all Dark Age Christian leaders were so willing to compromise with the pagan world. Certainly Martin of Tours took active measures to destroy altars erected to individuals who were shown not to be saints, and pagan temples. He is also recorded as cutting down a tree to which pagan rites were attached. Similar attacks on holy places in nature, including springs, were made by some of his successors. Among the pagan practices which were denounced in Gallic councils of the 6th and 7th centuries were the worship of holy trees and holy springs. The church did not pursue any single strategy, and it may well be that the geography of the holy in Italy, Gaul, Spain, and Africa, where Christian cult sites were new ones, reflected greater success for the more hardline party there. But even in Gaul there was, as we have seen, some scope for conversion by infiltration, and this may well have been the pattern which operated in Wales. The allusions to the cult suggest that it probably had an early origin, but do not give much assistance in resolving the questions of the saint's historicity and the nature of her alleged martyrdom, which must remain not proven. Whether or not she was a historical figure, however, the belief in her martyrdom was at any rate a historical fact. It was the lesson which this taught which was the basic function of the cult, and as the story associated with it emphasized that she died to save her virginity, it must clearly be seen as a hagiographer's device to stress the importance of that particular virtue. The similar fate of St. Winifred was related in order to point the same moral. One must, I think, take the idea of a martyr in the original sense of the Greek word meaning a witness. The story was intended to give testimony to a particular truth which was being taught. The fact that she was described as being of noble family, as so many Dark Age saints were, again mirrors early hagiographical tradition, which tended to pick its saints from the ranks of the powerful. The other striking feature of the cult is its long survival, because it demonstrates that although the church had come to terms with pagan society in the conversion period, by adaptation rather than by confrontation, pagan elements still survived in popular religion. The survival of another well cult in the 15th century is recorded in 1410, at no great distance, on the English side of the border. In that year, Bishop Maskell of Hereford forbade recourse to a well at Turnaston, on the River Door, some ten miles from his episcopal city and six miles upstream from Pontrilas. The episcopal mandate related that many subjects of the diocese had recourse to the well, even carrying mud away from it as a relic. The bishop's ban on such actions does not state if the practice was regarded as purely pagan or if, as at Brecon, there may have been some unmentioned veneer of Christianity over it. The removal of the mud from the well may, however, in its desire for preserving something tangible, parallel Worcester's story of the miraculous appearance of the so-called relic of a hare at St. Iluned's well. 
One of the most striking features of the Iluned cult was its persistence to the end of the Middle Ages, and it may indeed have spread out from its original site at Brecon. Worcester states that the saint's body was preserved at Usk, where a house of Benedictine nuns was founded in 1236. Although this indicates that the church authorities were still giving their blessing to the cult at this date, there is little sign that it acquired the same degree of popularity there as it had at Brecon. Worcester himself laid more stress on the practices at the spring than on any of the relics at Usk. Leland did not mention the saint in his description of the house at Usk in his itinerary, and among the offerings recorded there in the Valor Ecclesiasticus, there is no mention of any shrine. A reference to a 1520 agreement between the prior and the vicar of Brecon suggests that the former had a right to offerings at the chapel, but again, these are not mentioned in the Valor Ecclesiasticus. This would suggest that the level of appeal which the cult had at Usk cannot have been great, however much it survived at Brecon, either in the religious terms described by Worcester or in Hugh Thomas's description of folk customs. By this time, of course, the original function of the martyrdom and the moral and spiritual teaching to be drawn from it had been forgotten.